Hey everyone, welcome back from lunch. I hope that your stomachs are nice and full and you are able to learn a thing or two from the guys at Odd Bar. My name is Emily O'Connor and I'm the events chair on the Next Niagara Council. I hope you're having a wonderful time today at Engage. It's really exciting to have everyone here with us. To help us kick off the afternoon sessions, I'm really excited to be able to introduce you to Siobhan Deary, who will be presenting today on Business Finance 101. Siobhan is a local financial professional whose mission is to educate and empower her clients through thoughtful planning, patience, and discipline. While handling all aspects of financial planning for individuals and families, Siobhan has also become a business financial specialist. She is able to serve business owners with services from tax strategies to government funding, financial structure, employee retention, succession planning, and proper support when selling your business. As a family-oriented business owner herself, Siobhan understands the magnitude of what expert advice can do. I think it's safe to say that Siobhan will be able to teach us something new today, and I hope you have a pen and paper ready to start taking notes. I'm really excited to hand it over to you, Siobhan. Please help me welcome Siobhan Deary. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. So um, to begin, so uh, Business Finance 101, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about sole proprietorships, partnerships, and corporations. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at the advantages and disadvantages of both. And then we're going to review, you know, what really makes sense for your business is incorporating the right fit. And if so, how to fully take advantage of that um, structure. So um, as Emily was saying, so um, my name is Siobhan and I work at Simul Consulting. So we're an independent brokerage um, across Canada. And so what we do is we, we really represent pretty much all of the companies in the country. Um, and we focus on investment management and insurance planning for individuals, but we also have a business side as well. So we do the business financial planning and the structure like we're gonna talk about today. Um, we do buy sell agreements. So we work closely with uh, a merger, mergers and acquisitions firm to help you sell your business if you're looking to scale. Um, you know, finding investors, doing the debt financing, things like that. Um, and then we do tax planning as well. So I wanted to start off the presentation based on, um, you know, the sole proprietors, the partnerships and the corporations, just so moving forward, we're all on the same page as to what each model is. So sole proprietors and partnerships are the exact same um, with the difference being partnerships obviously are two or more people. So you share the responsibility there. But um, in those models, you're really fully responsible for the debts, the liabilities, and all of the legal costs. Um, you are your business and your business is you. Um, so all of your personal assets are involved in that. With regards to um, corporations, when you incorporate your business, it becomes its own separate legal entity, which creates a degree of separation um, between yourself and uh, the business, which means um, in terms of your personal assets, they're protected under that business structure. So uh, in terms of uh, sole proprietors and partnerships um, versus corporations, I mean, there's really advantages and disadvantages of both. Um, so we're gonna go through that. To start with sole proprietors and partnerships, um, the setup is very simple and low cost, um, and it's not as heavily regulated as a corporation. Whether you're you know, starting a business, looking to start a business, you have a side hustle, um, it's pretty easy to, to become a sole proprietor or a partnership in that degree. Um, and as we know, as entrepreneurs, when you start a business for the very first time, it's very likely that you don't always make money right away. And so if your business incurs any losses, those losses can be written off against your personal income. So should that be your side hustle or, or um, anything similar, you can kind of uh, use that to offset any taxes that you're paying for other incomes that you're, that you're uh, bringing in. <clears throat> in terms of corporations, um, like we said, it creates that uh, separation. So your personal assets are protected um, should you, you know, owe any money to creditors, should your business get sued. Um, anything that you own personally outside of the business um, would never be involved in, in any of those things. As well as the tax planning and the 
uh, estate planning opportunities available. So I'm actually going to talk about those in further detail in the next slide. So to move on to the disadvantages, um, as we were saying, you know, you have unlimited liability as a sole proprietor in a partnership. So should anything happen with creditors or you be sued, um, you know, your personal assets, the big one is always your house, stuff like that is really up for grabs. Um, in addition, as we all want our business to be profitable, the more money you make and as you grow and scale your business, um, again, you're in higher tax brackets and, you know, should you be making, you know, six figures, maybe you're in the highest tax bracket, you're paying over half of what you're making in your business to taxes. And so um, that's a big, big downfall for sole proprietors and partnerships. And usually when people start to look at corporations. There's another point that I want to stress, um, and it's a little different for sole proprietors and partnerships. So I'll give an example for each. If you're a sole proprietor and you were to pass away as the business owner, what ends up happening is the business ceases to exist and all of the assets are considered to be liquidated, which means, um, you know, your family and your beneficiaries um, are really, you know, responsible for any capital gains or any, you know, bills that are kind of due if that were to happen. Additionally, you would, you know, make the assumption that your business, any assets that you have will transfer to your family or whoever your beneficiaries are as a sole proprietor. And that's honestly not always the case. Um, it really de depends on um, how you have your will structured and how you have it set up. And if you have the legal documents in place for that to, to happen, because if not, it can be, become quite messy um, if something happens to you and you own a business. In terms of a partnership, I mean, it's pretty similar in the sense that, you know, the assets are liquidated, but it's the, you know, percentage of the partnership that you own. And where things can get um, a little complex is, you know, there's a surviving partner to take over the business and that's great, but the uh, family and the beneficiaries of the, you know, partner that passed away are entitled to their percentage of the business. And so, um, in terms of wills and you know legal documents, there's a lot of questions that you know are asked if you have a partnership and something like that happens. You know, how are you funding the family buyout? Um, are you bringing in another family member of the person who passed away to take their place? Um, is the one partner you know going off on their own and becoming a sole proprietor? There's a lot of like moving parts, and it can become quite complicated and um, quite messy legally. Uh, when not all of those questions are answered. So <clears throat> that can also be a big downfall of a sole proprietor and a partnership. So moving on to corporations, they can be pretty complex um, and it is a, a higher fee to, to set that up. And so when you're first learning about a, a corporation, it can be you know, a little daunting um, and sometimes people you know, shy away from that business model. There are administrative requirements. We're gonna talk about those towards the end of the presentation, but that's basically just talking about your shareholders and your board of directors. Like we said um, in the beginning for advantages for sole proprietors and partners, um, if you lose money in the beginning of your business, that's really stuck within the corporation. And so it, you can't offset it against your personal income. Um, that doesn't mean you can't offset it at all. It does, you know, can be worked against um, any other incomes or gains that the corporation has, but you just can't transfer it to yourself personally. So to go further into corporations and the tax and estate planning available, um, there's quite a lot and like this really just scratches the surface. Um, I could create an entire, you know, hour long presentation on just tax planning in a corporation. So um, take the few points that we're going to talk about with the grain and salt. There's much, much more than this. Um, you know, so it's sometimes difficult to explain the tax consequences of a corporation compared to a sole proprietorship, just because it's not an apples to apples comparison. If you're basically looking at how much money you make in a sole proprietor versus uh, a corporation, um, you know, you can say, yes, you know, if I'm making $50,000 in the sole proprietor, um, I'm paying X amount of tax and you can calculate that. Um, in a corporation, the tax um, 
brackets are, are lower. So yes, you save in that sense, but you still need to pay yourself. You know, you have bills, you have a mortgage, you're going to be taking money out of the corporation. Um, and so this is where the comparison, you know, can't really be made. And that's because yes, you can pay yourself a salary and an income, but you can take money out of your corporation in several different ways. And each of those ways are taxed differently. So um, taking money out, there's so many strategies that you can use that would be you know, tax efficient, depending on what the situation is and what you're trying to do. An example would be, you know, you can pay yourself dividends, you can pay yourself capital gains, um, stock options, stock refunds. Um, you can give yourself loans through the corporation as well, where you, you know, pay yourself and um, you put the terms, the percentage, everything around that. So there's really a lot that you can do um, to minimize the amount of tax that you pay as well, if it applies to you and your family, um, you can income split in a corporation as well, which is um, sometimes nice. And then there's the lifetime capital gains. So every individual, whether you're a business owner or not, has capital gains exemption. It's $883,000 um, that's over your lifetime. It's for things like when you sell you know, properties, stuff like that. Um, and so corporations have that too. They actually just have a higher amount. So it gives you a little extra cushion there. In terms of estate planning, so um, as we saw with the sole proprietors and the partnerships, should something happen to you um, in your business, when you, if you were to pass away, corporations, because they're their own legal entity, they continue to exist. Um, so, you know, the situation where everything's liquidated, um, you know, the company, any contracts like lease agreements or anything, um, they all continue um, indefinitely. And so, it really creates like a, a big um, opportunity and a lot of flexibility when you're transport you're transferring assets. Um, and this is, you know, especially true for families when you're trying to leave, you know, money to your kids, properties to your kids, whatever it is, any assets, a cottage. Um, it's very lucrative to do so within a corporation because you just make that person a shareholder. Um, and then now they own those things, right? So it's quite simple. Um, and it's an, another way to defer tax as well, because it's not taxable until you take it out. So whoever does that um, is then, you know, the owner of those things. So before we go on any further, um, we did talk about how, you know, the filing process is a little more complex and it costs more money. It's $360. You can do it in person by mail or online. Um, by mail, as you can imagine, especially during COVID, takes quite a long time. You're sending mail back and forth. It can easily get lost. We don't normally recommend that you do that. Um, we always tell our clients to go in person. The issue with this, especially being in Niagara, is that the Service Ontario office who deals with all of this, the closest one is in Toronto. So you really have to plan your day around it. Um, but it's $360. Um, that is the Service Ontario fee. So that's not, you know, my fee as an advisor. That's not the fee um, from CIMIL. That's just, you know, the government fee in order to incorporate your business. Um, and then moving down to online. So normally online is, makes the most sense and it's the easiest way to do things. And it does look like it's a little less expensive, but there's some issues with doing it online. One of them being Service Ontario doesn't provide the online service themselves, they contract it out to other companies. So yes, you're paying $300 instead of the 360, but you're then paying an online service fee for whatever company or contractor that you've chosen. When I was researching this for you guys, the service fees were anywhere from about $100 um, upwards to 800. And this is because they provide extra um, legal documents. Um, and as a sole proprietor or as an individual, when you're incorporating your business, you don't necessarily need those things. Um, but I would say if you're in a partnership, it makes a lot of sense to go to a lawyer before you um, file to incorporate um, strictly because of all of the questions. Right. So, you know, what happens if someone wants out? What happens if there's, you know, fallout between the partners? What happens in retirement? What happens if somebody passes away? There's a lot of, you know, extra things that you should take care of um, in a partnership that just don't necessarily translate if you're a sole proprietor. Um, so with that being said, we're going to move on. So 
I really wanted to talk about um, retirement planning specifically as a business owner because there's a couple of things that I've noticed um, not all business owners realize. Um, so there's personal pension plans and that's what we're going to focus on the PPP. Um, but before I get into that, just comparing it to the um, registered retirement savings plan. So um, to just catch everyone up, um, you know, it's a retirement savings plan. You can put money into your own. You can put money into your spouse. And what it really does is um, any money that you put into it is taken off of your income for the year. And then you get a nice tax refund at the end. So um, you're capped at 18% of your income um, to a max of about $28,000. So if I'm making $50,000 and I put $5,000 into an RRSP, my income drops down to forty five, dollars and that's what I'm taxed on. Um, the individual pension plan. So this is only for people who are incorporated and um, it acts in a similar way to uh, a registered retirement savings plan in the sense that, you know, you can tax deduct it. It's, you know, you accumulate. But what it is, is it's a defined benefit plan. Basically, all that means is you know, regardless of how old you are now, at retirement, you know to the dollar how much you're going to be getting in your pension. Um, so say that's $500,000. What happens is every year they're going to calculate how much money you need to put into the plan to make sure that in X amount of years when you retire, say at 65, it's $500,000 to the penny. So there's a couple things with this. Um, every year when they do the calculation, you must make that contribution. And, you know, in certain economic climates, as you know, we saw in 2020, um, some businesses were closed pretty much all year. And so if you have an individual pension plan and they're, you know, making the calculation and they're like, you know, you have to put $10,000 into your IPP and you've been closed all year because of pandemic, like they don't care, you need to put $10,000 into it. And so it, that's kind of like the catch 22 with those plans. They're great and they're, they're good for, you know, incorporated individuals. Um, but you are, you know, tied to making the contributions no matter what. Okay. So personal pension plans, this is normally what we, um, you know, recommend and it's available, you know, whether you're incorporated or not, it's anyone with a business, you can own a franchise, you can be incorporated, it doesn't matter. And again, it's the same tax deductions as an RRSP, um, but uh, instead of being capped at the 18%, the $28,000, you just have significantly more room to put money in each year. And as a business owner, it's just nice to have that flexibility so you can save more. Um, and should you have already been saving in an RRSP, you can actually just roll it over into a personal pension plan. It's tax exempt. There's no um, fees or anything to do it. Um, so it just kind of allows that compounding um, should you have already been uh, saving in another vehicle. Like I said, with the contribution flexibility. So um, last year, we'll give the example of the IPP, um, this plan if you know they're saying, yeah, so if you want to make, you know, $500,000 for retirement, um, you need to put in eight grand this year. Um, this plan allows you to not contribute in off years, um, which is always nice. If you make less than seven and a half percent, they allow you to put more money into it. Um, if you're trying to get to a certain dollar amount, which is always nice as well, if it's not making as enough money as you, as you thought. Um, and then in terms of options at retirement, so normally what happens if you have an RRSP, you have to put it into a LIF or a RIF. And what that is, is it's a lifetime income fund. Um, and basically that's just the vehicle that then pays you the money that you've been saving all of these years, whether it's monthly or however you do it. Um, and usually that's the only option. Um, so for these plans, you can buy annuities, you can give yourself a monthly pension. There's different things that you can do, um, which again, at retirement, having you know more than the one option is always nice. So to move on from just having um, retirement savings in your corporation, you can actually invest inside your business as well. Um, you can open you know tax-free savings accounts. You can open you know, accounts and, and buy stocks, EFTs. If you wanted to open an account and start buying crypto and stuff like that, you can do so within your business. 
And um, again, one of the reasons that people would do that and why they would want to do that is say you're putting, I don't know, uh, $5,000 in your tax-free savings account this year, you have to pay yourself that money to then put it in your personal tax-free savings account. So to bypass having to do that, keeping it in the corporation at a lower tax bracket, you can just do that right inside the business. So it really allows you to build your wealth and to have the savings and the different things that you want to do without having to pay yourself all of that money. So sounds good. You can have investments into your, in your corporation, but what other assets can you um, have? So there's a few things and these things are above and beyond anything to do with your business, like any machinery, um, any vehicles, any stuff like that, that's, um, you know, for your business, whether you have, you know, trucks or company cars that you use, um, these are extra things. So, you know, we talked about your, your investment accounts and you can also have, you know, your personal insurance policies and stuff like that in it. Um, and this is a, something that I think, you know, people don't necessarily think about. So I'll give you an example to explain why this would make sense. If you have an insurance policy and say you're paying $500,000, $500 a month for it, um, say I am at a 40% tax bracket. So for me to pay that $500 premium, I need about $950 before tax um, at my personal tax bracket of 40% in order to pay that premium. If I have my insurance policy um, inside the corporation and I have the corporation pay for it and say my corporation, the tax bracket is 12%, um, I would only need about you know, $550 to $600 before tax to pay for that same $500 premium. Um, so just by having the insurance policy that I would be getting anyways, having the corporation pay for it, you're saving about you know, $300, $350. Um, just by having it structured in that way. Um, so, you know, over time, that's huge savings, right? So think about that over like 10, 15, 20 years. In terms of vehicles, this kind of ties in as well with your investment accounts. Like maybe it's just that time where you have to upgrade your car. You've had it for a while. It's kind of beat up. You need to buy another one and you're saving for it in your tax-free savings account. You can just do that in your business. You can have the corporation purchase the vehicle and give it to you as the owner as a, as a taxable benefit. So that's something that we would run the numbers on to really see if that makes sense um, and if there's a lot of savings uh, in there for you. But um, it's just another thing to think about, right? And then in terms of real estate investments, um, you can have quite a lot of real estate investments in there. It doesn't necessarily have to be with your business, like the, the building that you're say your stores in, um, you know, you can buy, uh, you know, rental properties. If you want to buy a cottage, um, a condo in Florida, there are several things that you can do um, to have the corporation pay for it. And if you rent those out, any of the rental income then kicks back to the corporation at a lower tax bracket. So that sounds great. I have three uh, rental properties and they're all in my name. And um, yeah, I'm going to incorporate, put all of my, you know, real estate into the corporation. It's going to pay, you know, less uh, income tax. I'm going to keep more money. And that sounds great. Cool. Okay. So if you pay attention to anything in the presentation, I think this should be the thing um, and it's deemed disposition. So basically the government doesn't allow you to do that as nice as it sounds. Um, and this is why. So a deemed disposition, if I have, say, two rental properties and I'm getting rental income and it's, you know, it's bumping up my personal income tax and I'm paying a lot of tax. Um, if I were to uh, incorporate and put those rentals into the corporation, it looks like on paper that I have personally sold the, the properties to the corporation and it results in a capital gains. And especially with buildings and property, the capital gains can be quite a lot and you're hit with a big tax bill. So incorporating, should you be thinking about um, investing in real estate or you know, buying you know, whatever types of assets that 
would be making you money, um, it makes sense to incorporate before you buy them. And if you are already investing in real estate, you have to think about, you know, um, am I going to continue to do so? Um, and if so, does it make sense to incorporate and have any new properties that I purchase inside the corporation to save money that way? Um, because if not, if you transfer any assets that you already own personally into the corporation, it creates a deemed disposition and you get hit with a huge capital gains. <laughs> that being said, there are capital gains exemptions, um, but you don't necessarily want to eat into all of it at once as well. So um, basically, uh, we talked about a lot of things, right? So tax planning, estate planning, retirement, assets, so many different things. And a lot of the times um, people, you know, incorporate their business, but don't take advantage of any of those things. So simply incorporating your business really doesn't make sense um, if you're not going to design it in a way to take advantage. So the design of your business and how you're going to structure um, whatever model you choose really, really matters. So to quickly go over the administrative um, aspects of the uh, corporations, there's two things, shareholders and board of directors. So shareholders, basically they own a piece of your company and um, you don't need to uh, have anyone become a shareholder. Um, but if you do, you have to meet annually and discuss the business. So <clears throat> this would make sense if, you know, um, in terms of like uh, retirement planning, estate planning, usually people make their families um, shareholders, you make your spouse any children. Um, and if you are a shareholder, you don't necessarily have to pay them an income, right? So if you make your spouse a shareholder at 5%, um, that doesn't mean that you have to pay them 5% of your earnings. It just means they own 5% of the company. And then board of directors. So um, their role in your business is to just supervise. Um, so same thing, they have to be um, over 18 um, and you have to have at least one person in your board um, regardless. And 25% of those people have to be Canadian residents. I think that's important just because um, you know, people have families in other countries, maybe your, you know, your brother or your siblings, cousins live, you know, somewhere else in the States or wherever, they can be a part of your board. You just need to have um, another person that lives in Canada, part of that as well. And again, you have to meet annually. So a lot of the times this makes sense where um, the shareholders are, you know, your spouse and your kids, you just make them, you know, part of the board of directors as well. You have those annual meetings. Um, and in terms of the meetings, you know, there's a lot of tax deductions available as well. Um, so there's ways to take advantage of having to have that board meeting um, to, you know, have some extra tax deductions for your business and your income. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to leave, you know, just with four main areas to think about as a business owner. Um, you know, if you're a sole proprietor or partner, um, maybe you're looking at starting a business or your side hustle and you're, you know, really looking at what the future holds for you. There's four things to consider. So the legal liabilities, um, would you benefit from having the, uh, person, having your personal assets, um, sheltered basically, right? So as a sole proprietor, they're exposed. Would it make sense for you to, to keep them safe in terms of administration? You're just looking at the shareholders and board of directors. Do you have a family? You know, does that make sense to have them a part of the company? Um, and what would that look like for you? Tax planning, um, you know, as we said, there's tons and tons of tax planning available. We talked about some things. So um, that's something to consider as well. And then your retirement and estate planning. Again, are you trying to leave any assets to your kids, to your family? Um, and what does that look like? Those are the four things that we would look at as a company and then we would make a recommendation for you. So you know your business better than anyone else. And so, you know, just leaving you with those four areas to think about um, can really kind of help make a decision. So what I've done is I've put all my contact information on there. Um, I have Karina monitoring the chat for any questions, but I do understand that 
you know, your business is personal, your situation is personal. You don't necessarily have to ask a question in front of everyone if you don't want to, that's maybe specific to you. Um, you're more than welcome to email me. Our website's there, our socials are there. You can call me anytime um, with any questions and I'm happy to answer. We are running a little short on time, but we did get a question in. So I want to I want to make sure to get that question in. So so Drew asks, um, could you provide an example of what could be tax deducted from uh, hosting the board of directors meetings? Yeah, so when you have a board of directors meetings, you know, there's uh, a few things that you can do. Um, I know a lot of people take this into consideration when their board of their board members or their family. So it makes a lot of sense for, um, you know, mom, dad, adult kids. Um, but, you know, your board meeting needs to happen no matter where in the world it is. And so, you know, if you go to Florida every year and you have your um, board meeting in Florida, well, the reason you went there is to have your board meeting, which means your trip there, you know, is essential for your business. And so it's a way to uh, tax deduct trips and stuff like that. Um, maybe you go to Toronto overnight, stuff like that, right? So um, there's ways to take advantage that way. Um, the flight, the hotel, the meals, that kind of thing. Yeah, That's right. So instead of having your board meeting in your basement, you are having it, but you're having it, you know, at brunch in Miami. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Thanks, yeah. Siobhan. Thanks, Drew, for your question. Um, Siobhan will be hanging around, so I'm sure you can find her in the networking um, section of today's event. Um, and uh, this session will be recorded as well um, if you missed anything. So uh, just looking at the time, we're heading back over to the main stage. Uh, upcoming, we have uh, Adam Durant uh, talking about the future of labor in Niagara. So thank you for joining us. I'm Karina Mascott, the next Niagara staff liaison. And thank you so much to Javon for being here. And we'll see you at the main stage shortly. Thank you.